Hey everybody, got a big announcement for you. This summer, I am gonna be making my very first convention appearance. I am gonna be a guest at Sci-Fi Horror Fest, which is happening August 26th and 27th in Vernon, New York. I'll be doing a live Q&A as well as a live movie riff, along with my pal Cecil from Good Bad Flicks and Pete from The Cinemasochist. So if you've ever wanted to meet me in person, here's your chance. I'll also have some merch for sale, and if there's anything you want me to sign, feel free to bring it. Just go to Sci-Fi Horror Fest com for more info. I'll also post the link down below so you can check it out. I've never been to a convention before, not even as an attendee, so this is going to be a whole new experience. And if you're able to make it, I hope to see you there. Until next time. Okay, so far I've done a good amount of 50s monster flicks on this show. We've had giant snails, scorpions, tarantulas, 50-foot women, not to mention whatever the hell the giant claw was. But now I think it's time I did a 50s movie with a really weird monster in it. Prepare yourselves for Fiend Without a Face. <laughs> Fiend Without a Face is a 1958 British sci-fi horror movie that isn't exactly well known, but in recent years it's gotten a bit of a following, mainly for its uniquely bizarre monster. And I don't just mean it's weird for how cheap it is, like Robot Monster or the Giant Claw. No, 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 this is one genuinely weird monster, but like a lot of 50s movies, you're gonna have to wait a while to see it, so let's stop wasting time and dive right in. So in true 50s sci-fi movie fashion, we start off at a U.S. military base located in... Canada? Okay, that's a new one. Usually movies just film in Canada and pretend it's America. Make no mistake though, even if it's in Canada, this is still a U.S. military base. Gotta protect the 51st state after all. So we have a British movie, but it's set in Canada, but most of the characters are supposed to be American. How often does that happen? Anyway, before this soldier's able to take a healthy smoke break, he's interrupted by the movie's first kill. Damn, and that guy was just two seconds from making it past the opening title. And just one letter away from meeting a friend without a face. He probably wouldn't have gotten murdered then. So like the opening implied, most of the movie takes place around a U.S. Air Force base located near the town of Winthrop, Manitoba. And if anyone's wondering, no, there is no Winthrop, Manitoba. There is a place called Brandon, though. Well, other than the murder thing seem to be going smoothly around here, the men are performing their daily stock footage maneuvers. Our main character is Major Jeff Cummings, and if anyone's wondering if I'm gonna make any jokes about his name in this video, eh, yeah, probably. You ever think of trying sleep instead of Benzedrine? You know you might like it. Oh, and he's a speed addict. Well, good to know he's keeping the skies over Canada safe. Unlike other 50s sci-fi movies, the only giant bugs here are the ones Jeff thinks are crawling under his skin. Well, there's been a murder near the base. Uh, you guys gonna investigate that? Let the local authorities figure it out, Jeff. Well, the colonel doesn't think it's that easy, and neither do I. But there's probably some simple explanation. Look, it's a 50s sci-fi movie, which means the cause is gonna be one of two things. Radiation or UFOs? They'll probably blame the death on our atomic reactors. Mm. It's his fear of radioactive fallout. Radiation it is! So I guess the military's using nuclear power to increase the range of their radar? Eh, whatever, considering all the other stuff radiation can do in 50s movies, I guess it can do that too. However, the local townsfolk don't like the military's experiments and blame them for all of their problems. You know we're a thousand miles from the nearest decent-sized city? Mm. What a bunch of backward people. They've blamed us for... Too little rain, too much rain? Oh, what do you know? Looks like they did do some research into what Manitoba's like. For real though, setting the movie in rural Canada is actually a decent way to get the characters isolated. Modern filmmakers take note. Instead of having your characters wander off into the woods, just set the movie in Canada. Chances are you'll be far away from shit. Time for Jeff to meet the town mayor and the victim's sister. Maybe they'll buy that radiation can actually be used as a health treatment. I'd like to introduce Miss Barbara Grizzell and Mayor Hawkins, Major Cummings. She'll be your love interest for the movie, so you might want to hide your wedding ring there, Major. Give it to her, Major. Okay, okay, he will. Just give them some time to get to know each other first. And I know the perfect way to do that. Just give her a ride home. Beats having to take a dog sled or whatever Canadians use. Oh, I don't know. I guess I was looking for a way to say I... Well, I understand what you've been through. 
Do you? Sure I do. When I was a kid, my brother got killed by the mole people. What the heck? I'm human. We're all human here. We're not monsters from outer space. Okay, come on, Jeff. We've already established that radiation's the cause of the monsters, not UFOs. Well, it's the 50s and I just gave you a ride home, so that means we're officially a couple now. I'd walk you to your door, but that would pretty much mean we're married. Back at the base, they're testing out their new experiment. I think they're working on a way to control the weather so Manitoba winters only last eight months instead of nine. Look, sir. Siberia. Or maybe it's just a primitive version of Google Maps. But you know what this experiment needs? More radiation. I want you to give us everything you've got. If I take any more of those rods out, the reactor's liable to get out of control. We'll have to risk it. We've got to have more power. Yeah, Jeff is like the Tim Allen of radiation experiments. Look, as long as you keep things a sliver below danger, it should be fine. And if something does go wrong, it'll probably just be Japan's problem. Or who knows, maybe it'll be enough to raise Barbara's brother from the grave. Oh yeah, here's another thing about this movie. Apparently they think 1950s Canada is like turn of the century Ireland. Closer and closer. Thank goodness the cows are getting used to them. Aye. And it sounds like it too. Time for another death scene. And while we didn't see what killed that guy at the beginning, get used to it, because we don't see it here either. Mainly because the monster's invisible. <laughs> Alright, now I know what some of you are thinking. An invisible monster? Really? Is this gonna be one of those cheap-ass movies where they never show the monster just to save money? Well, most times you'd be right, but in this case, it's actually building to something good. Just trust me. Besides, even if we can't see the monster, the sound effects paint a vivid picture. Oh, what do you know? Turns out sound effects can be gory too. With two more murders, the military's got some splaining to do. There is absolutely no evidence pointing to radioactive fallout or radioactive contamination of any kind. Those people had leukemia before we started our experiments, okay? Before! All right, time to get to the bottom of what did kill these people. The local doctor performed an autopsy and set the mood lighting. I opened the skull to investigate and found this. For the brain, it's gone. That's not all. The entire spinal cord is missing. Where's the brain and spinal cord gone? Oh, I don't know, maybe they auditioned for the movie Blood Diner. Only one thing to do now, keep quiet and don't tell the townspeople. It just lead to gossip anyway. After this, Jeff goes to visit Barbara, leading to a 1950 shower scene, which, honestly, I'm surprised is even in this movie. Yeah, sure, they don't show anything, but for 1958, this would probably get this one of those 1950s X ratings British movies had for some reason. Uh... Miss Grizel? I heard the shower going and just wanted to confirm you were naked. Okay, it's 1958. Seeing her in a towel's basically like seeing her naked. While Barbara's busy slipping into something more 50s appropriate, Jeff discovers she's been working for a professor named Walgate who's been doing some experiments of his own, particularly ones in mind control. So, are you correlating his material? I do most of it. He dictates on this. I edit the tapes and prepare the draft manuscripts. I was going to scold you for having a job, but as long as it's secretary, I guess that's okay. Oh, he still works. Mm, and at odd hours. Odd hours? Mm, he thinks nothing of starting work at 11 at night and working until the small hours of the morning. Hey, don't judge, all right? I mean, some people aren't meant for nine to five jobs. I mean, as long as the video gets done, does it matter what time I make them? All right, enough chit chat. Time for Jeff to work his magic. Hey, baby, wanna know why they call me Major Cummings? Hello, Howard. Come on in. Well, great. Thanks, Constable Cockblock. Wow, Jeff really is pissed off this guy interrupted him. Well, since Jeff can't get with Barbara just yet, instead he decides to read up on what Professor Walgate is an expert in, including... Cybonetics? All right, it is 1958, so we're lucky he's not reading a book that just says science on it. And it's been long enough that we should probably get another murder scene. While most 50s movies don't show the monster until at least the halfway point, here they're technically showing it, we just can't see it. No, not my spinal cord. I need that to not be dead. All right, fellas, all right now. Let's stop this nonsense. 
No fancy atomic radiation caused these deaths. Yeah, it was probably just toxic waste or something. And once again, about those Canadian accents. Now the fellow we're after is out there in the woods. Probably some air base GI that's gone wild. Now we can't get far if we move fast and I say let's stop jabbering and get after what? it. That's right, laddie. Faith and Bagar, I am so Canadian. Oh, Danny boy, our home and native land. Be on the lookout, fellas. There's got to be some radiation in these woods somewhere. Meanwhile, Jeff goes looking for Professor Walgate, which also gives him a chance to keep macking on Barbara. Nice to see you again. I'm very busy. She is totally into him. Jeff meets with Professor Walgate, who sounds British, which in this movie means he's probably from Montreal. That business of her brother, I don't want to seem morbid, but did you see his face after he died? Yes. What was it like? Well, it was like some fiend without a face. The professor also gets upset the more Jeff asks some questions, which means he's probably innocent. While this is going on, the townsfolk keep searching the woods. At least I think it's supposed to be while the other part's going on. These parts with the people searching the woods seem to be at night, while Jeff goes to Walgate's house during the daytime, so maybe they're not happening at the same time? Wait, now they're searching the woods during the day? When the hell do these scenes take Take place. Whatever, just get to another invisible monster scene. Maybe they can suck out the part of this guy's brain that thinks this is a convincing Canadian accent. But they can't quit now. We've almost reached the airbase. Well. Gibbons! Gibbons! And things are getting serious. They better have a town meeting about these murders. All I know is before this airbase came here, we were doing fine. But forgetting about the deaths. How do you explain the change in quality of the cow's milk, even the quantity? Yeah, man, the murders are one thing, but what about our milk? I got dry cereal here! And as if the unsolved murders weren't the only thing this town had to worry about. I think that's rather <laughs> foolish, Adam. And now they also have a ghost? Oh, wait, it's just the constable. And by the looks of it, he's been hit by a yokel ray. <laughs> Yep, no doubt about it. He's come down with a terminal case of the sillies. What could have happened to him? I don't know. I think Professor Walgate is involved in these deaths. Oh, come on. A scientist in a 50s movie involved with whatever's going on? Get the hell out of here, Jeff. People have been getting their brains sucked out, so better check the cemetery for zombies. Or maybe vampires? What the hell is going on here? I know this movie's British, but we're not making a Hammer movie here. Somebody locks Jeff inside the crypt, but it's okay, he gets rescued a little bit later. Hey, thanks for helping me out. Anyway, I think it's either vampires or zombies killing people, I'm not really sure. Eh, who am I kidding? Professor Walgate's probably the one responsible. What were you doing in the cemetery tonight, Professor? I didn't mean to shut you in. Close the door on you. I was frightened when I heard you. I, I only wanted time to get away. Oh, so you admit it was you. Okay, well in that case you're under arrest. The professor fakes a stroke or something. Maybe that'll get him out of trouble. It's a terrible story. That's no, not that bad. I mean, a little routine so far, but... I've seen worse 50s sci-fi movies. The professor decides to confess what the hell is going on. Turns out he was conducting experiments in telekinesis. Why? Because he wanted to turn the page of a book. I concentrated on the simplest experiment, to turn the page of a book. Really? That's the cause of all this trouble? If you wanted to read without turning a page, why didn't you just invent a Kindle or something? Professor Walgate tried to augment his brainwaves with electricity and used the army's nuclear reactor to give him some extra power. Somehow this led to invisible thought monsters because, you know, radiation or whatever. I knew now that I had created a fiend. Okay, but did this fiend have a face? I now know that I have created a mental vampire and then followed these horrible deaths in Gibbon's madness. Oh, so you're admitting you're responsible for the murders, too. Okay, now you're under arrest. Before that, though, explain just why the hell we can't see these things. If we'd only see them, we'd know what to do. Is there any way to make them visible? Sure, increase the budget. Okay, there is another way. The monsters break into the nuclear power plant and overload the reactor, which causes them to become visible. And it's in these last 15 minutes where all the build-up and invisible monster bullshit finally pays off because now we get to see the monsters. Take a look. 
That's right, the monsters are moving brains with spinal cord tails and eye stalk tentacles. No simple giant bugs for this movie. It's one of the most awesomely ridiculous monsters in a 50s movie ever. And they don't cheap out and have them stay still either. They actually animate them, even if the stop motion here isn't exactly Ray Harryhausen quality. At this point, the movie becomes a siege film with the characters trying to keep the brain monsters from breaking in. But these brains have been taking some notes from Santa Claus. Look at this, it's like something you'd see in an early Sam Raimi or Peter Jackson movie, not a 50s monster flick. Oh, and by the way, that includes violence-wise, too. Damn, in what other 50s movie are you gonna see oozing brains? This has gotta be one of the goriest 50s flicks ever. While the brains attack the house, Jeff goes out to try and shut down the reactor, and the professor... Uh... Just what the hell is he doing? Come, Professor, you can't! It's suicide! They're my creation, perhaps I can control them. If you think you can control them, shouldn't you have been trying to do that already? But sure, try talking to the brain monsters. I'm sure that'll go well. <laughs> ah, I just wanted to turn a page in my book! That was a brave man. Yeah, if by brave you mean stupid. Hopefully Jeff has more luck with his mission. You better hurry, though. The brains are learning to use tools. George Romero presents Night of the Living Brains. Well, looks like the brains have made it inside. Oh well, at least that means we get more 50s gore. And just listen to those sound effects. Ugh, God, it's like the brains are all filled with Hormel chili. While this is going on, Jeff decides to stop the reactor by blowing up the control panel with some dynamite. Because sure, that sounds safe. Uh, hey buddy, take it from a brain, that is not a smart idea. Wow! Oh, I was just trying to help you out, you prick! Ugh. And as long as I'm doing stupid brain voices, screw it, might as well do this too. Hey baby, how about a little head? <coughs> Quick Jeff, hurry up and blow up the control panel, which I guess will help somehow. Just kidding. Instead, blowing up the control panel makes the radiation levels go back to normal, causing the brains to dissolve in more gooey special effects. And I know I already mentioned Sam Raimi, but I am genuinely curious to know if he was a fan of this movie. Congratulations, Jeff, you stopped the brains. And if you play your cards right, you might get some, too. Well, Major, I'm leaving you in charge. Report back when you have the... Situation well in hand. I'm talking about after you banger, Jeff. So there's Fiend Without a Face, one of the only 50s invisible monster movies that actually kind of works. Okay, sure, the decision to keep the monsters invisible for most of the movie was probably just to save money. And like most 50s monster flicks, buckle up for a lot of slow, talky scenes and a shoehorned-in romance subplot you probably don't care about. But the finale makes it all worthwhile. I mean, come on, where else are you gonna see stop-motion brain and spinal cord monsters attacking people and oozing blood? It's definitely no classic, but it does have one of the most memorably out-there monsters of any 50s movie. Plus, you get to see what happens when British people make a movie set in Canada that's aimed at Americans. Which mostly results in a lot of really unconvincing accents. Well, that's all for now. Until next time! Hey, what do you think of the new couch?